Hey everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today I want to start a new reading vlog and this one again a very exciting because we are starting the third uh, series that I want to marathon read this year. I already did two. I did the Dandelion Dynasty series and the Gilded Wolves trilogy and now we're gonna do the what is it called? Drowning Empires? <laughs> Um, trilogy. So we're going to start with the Bone Shard Daughter, then we have the Bone Shard Emperor and I think the Bone Shard War. So I'm very excited to get into these books. I actually don't really know anything about them except that we will have some islands, we will have bone magic and we will have these constructs that are brought to life with um, the bone magic and that way we will get some kind of like an animal companion I believe. So that's all I know. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you more about this once I have gotten a little bit into the series and the way this works is that I will always update you when I'm halfway through one of the books and then when I finish the book so you can see my journey throughout this series. So I really hope you enjoy this and yeah let's go. So I am halfway through Bone Shard Daughter and I thought I'd give you a quick update. So far I am really enjoying this book even though I'm very distracted with like life things but I have noticed that most of these chapters take me out of my like <laughs> thought spirals like really well and I can really concentrate on the audiobook quite well which speaks to its quality and the enjoyment that I have when I listen to it which makes me really really happy because I think um, the first book in this series is the most beloved and then a lot of people were more disappointed with the sequels and the finale so we'll see. <laughs> I try to keep an open mind because one reason why I like to marathon read these series is because you have a different feel for them because if you've read like the second book a year ago and now you're going into the finale some things probably just hit different so I prefer the way a series feels when I read it all at once so I keep an open mind maybe I will have an unpopular opinion with this one but so far, the first half of the first book was really great. We have different perspectives and in the audiobook we also have three different narrators. So we have like two main perspectives, I would say, and that is Lynn and Jovis. Lynn is the emperor's daughter, so probably the person the book is named after. And... Um, Jovis is kind of a smuggler and I would say his perspective is the biggest part right now and the one that I enjoy the most. I absolutely love him so much and um, you've probably heard that there is an, kind of like an animal companion like a magical creature companion in this book and this companion belongs to Jovis. So those chapters are my absolute favorite so far. And then we do get perspectives that are a little bit rarer but still seem to be quite important. So we have I think Fallow and Ronami. I'm sorry if I have a little bit trouble with the names but if I listen to something on audio sometimes I can't remember the name so well but this is a female female couple that we're seeing where one Falu, <laughs> one of the girls, is um, the daughter of a governor so she has a little bit more power while her girlfriend is um, she was brought up in poverty she's an orphan and she's trying to be part of a revolution so we have a lot of tension with those and then we also get the perspective of a person called Sand, which you can have some theories who that is, but Sand doesn't actually remember who she is. She is on an island and she doesn't know why and she's doing these like chores and again she doesn't know why and it's very mysterious. So uh, what we have going on with this series is basically that we're seeing this empire that is all islands 
and the emperor has a certain kind of magic where he uh, collects bone shards. Like every person who lives in the empire at a certain age has to have a piece of bone behind the ear removed and these bone shards are used for the magic to create constructs and those are basically like patched together animals and then you can kind of write instructions on the bone shards and then these constructs will fulfill certain tasks like you have spy constructs and you have like ones who are at the docks working in the administration and stuff like that so um that's the kind of like magic and the people are not very happy about it because if your bone shard is used for a long time then you will get a sickness and you will lose a lot of energy and eventually die and so it is a very high risk thing and then also a lot of the children when they get the shards removed um, also die it just because it's not surgeons who do it but just soldiers so they don't really know what they're doing this world has a lot of issues we see a lot of like the different like classes and how the oppression works in this world and then we see these like mostly young women who try to find their place in this world but also try to change things for the better and then we have Jovis <laughs> who has his own goal like he is looking for someone and um he doesn't see himself as a hero and I'm very intrigued to see where that goes <laughs> so yeah I love it so far. I really, really enjoy what's going on. So I will go into a couple of tiny spoilers because I'm not that far into the book yet. But if you don't want to hear that, just skip over it with the chapters and I'll let you know what I thought when I finished the book. But yeah, Jovis and Mephi. It's just, it is a perfection. I love it so much. The mystery, but also just the relationship and the description of Mephi, like what he does, um, how he's just so cute. <laughs> it's amazing. I really, really love it. So um, yeah, from the moment where uh, he saves Mephi, um, whether he really saved him, we don't know. But Mephi kind of chose him, I would say. Like he was like, hey, let me on your boat. And then now Joe was getting all of these um, these powers, I guess, like his strength and healing faster and stuff. And then Mephi talking <laughs> is just my favorite. It's so cute. You can't even imagine how often I now have very good and not good <laughs> in my head <laughs> just because it's so adorable. <laughs> And I love it. So yeah, that is that is definitely my favorite. So now I'm at the point where they are meeting with the shardless, whatever they're called, like the shardless people. Um, so we'll see about that because now we have a first moment where some of the storylines um, converge. Is that how you say it? So Ronami and Jovis just met for the first time. And I guess that these like crossover things will happen more and more as the series progresses but yeah they just entered the cave so I have no idea what's gonna happen next but it's very interesting. I must say that Lin's storyline so far is the most boring to me. I'm pretty sure that things will pick up there but yeah it's just it is interesting like that she doesn't really remember who she is this is a trope that you can love or hate i feel kind of meh about it like i do like the mystery of it but i don't feel like we're really diving in there right now but it's more like her trying to look into the future and get her position so i'm intrigued to see what happens with her and her kind of like stepbrother, adoptive brother, whatever he is, um, because there is definitely some romance potential there, which would be like kind of enemies to lovers or like rivals to lovers. So we'll see what we get there. But yeah, so far, um, I don't really connect to her as a character or like find it very interesting what's happening to her. Even though the last scene where she is at the family dinner and then the contract comes and she uses her magic in front of these like normal people that was quite interesting so I meant I am intrigued to see where 
it goes but I feel like with her I have a very slow start where I really love Falu. <laughs> I'm so intrigued to see what her story arc is gonna be but like from the first scene where she is like training with the like guard person and they're talking about her relationship with Ranami and stuff like that. Um, I already loved her then, so I'm very intrigued to see where that goes. I love how she's so passionate, but also a little bit naive. Um, it's an interesting combination that I usually enjoy. So yeah, I would say I'm off to a good start and I'll let you know how it goes. So I have finished Bone Short Daughter and I thought I'd give you a quick update. I actually finished it yesterday and as always with my brain, especially after I had a migraine, it's already getting a bit fuzzy so just bear with me. But yeah, I finished the book, I really enjoyed it, I had a lot of fun with this book and so I decided to give it four stars in the end and I would definitely recommend it if you do like fantasy, like adventure stories. I think um, for me, why it's only four stars, one of the reasons is that I cared about Jovis's point of view so much more than all of the others. And that for me is usually a sign that the story is kind of unbalanced, that I just can't connect with all of the characters in the same way. And the character I had the biggest trouble with connecting to was actually Lynn. And I think it makes sense if you know her story, but still I feel like it just is a bit unbalanced in that regard. And so yeah, it is fun, it is cool. I really like the ideas and I especially like Mephi. <laughs> and so uh, yeah, four stars it is. And I'm very intrigued to read the rest of the series. I will take a mini break and read one book in between and then I'll go into the second book. I don't think that there is anything else I really have to say after the last um, spoiler free update. So um, yeah, I think I will just go into a couple of spoilers for the people who have read the series and you can jump over this with the th chapters. I. I love Mephi. Okay, let's just say that. I just want to still be like head of the fan club of Mephi. It's such a great like creature, whatever he turns out to be. And I was so surprised when at the end we got a second Mephi. That was definitely unexpected. And also that this other Mephi, I did not catch the name, I'm sorry but that it was somehow connected to the creation of the human constructs. That was also something I did not expect. And so we definitely see that all of these magical abilities that we see with Mephi, there is something deeper to that. There is something that has also been explored by the emperor and um, also exploited by the Emperor. So I'm really, really intrigued to see where that goes, uh, whether we will see them together. I really loved the ending of this book with Jovis um, being like the head of the guard or whatever he is now and how he's like, hmm, now I've sworn allegiance to two opposing sides. What, what am I gonna do? <laughs> and it was just such a Jovis ending and I just enjoyed his character so, so, so much. His bond to Mephi is so precious, but also just the way he's he's just trying to do something good, but he's definitely struggling as well. And I thought his character was still the most interesting, also in the second part of the book. I did not like that he got separated from Mephi for such a long time. That was not my favorite because their conversations are what kept me breathing um, in the last couple of days. Now with Lin, we see that she learns that she is not actually the daughter of the emperor, which was something that you can kind of guess from the beginning because all of her like memory loss stuff is very sketchy. Um, so she learns that she's actually also a construct. And I thought it was so interesting because I really thought that her and the other guy Bayan or whatever his name is, that they would have a romance, but now he's actually dead. 
then I, I did not see that coming. So I'm intrigued to see how that progresses, kind of. And obviously now we have the whole like ending thing where we see that again the what are they called like the beings that were there before like all of their like old artifacts are starting to like open their eyes or whatever so there is definitely something afoot that i want to learn more about i'm still struggling with lynn as a character which is weird to me because she's exactly the kind of character i should like i do love ambitious women who are cutthroat so i don't know why i'm struggling with her so much but i feel like there's not enough there and as I said it makes sense because she doesn't have those memories and she's not real being so obviously there is something missing with her but I, I just still struggle with that a little bit. I'm definitely so intrigued to see how the whole thing with Sand will go because now we know that she either is the Emperor's wife which would mean that she must be quite old by now or that she's also a construct that was supposed to become the Empress wife at some point and she has those memories. So something like that is going on there. And we still don't know um, really what happened to Amala, but we do learn that Lynn has her eyes. And I do think, and now the bad memory comes into play, that someone in the community was mentioned who had no eyes. So that would probably be her. And yeah, now we have Sand being like, I'm gonna be the queen now and I'm gonna I'm gonna have an army, so I have no idea what will happen with that. Um that is that is quite wild to me, but I do enjoy it. And then we have the whole Falu thing. Now she is the kind of governor of her island and again I don't really know where that goes, if it goes anywhere at all or whether she's kind of served the purpose for the story now and we will not see her again in the sequel. I could very well imagine that too. So yeah, I'm really intrigued. Um, to see how it all continues. I'm definitely having fun. I need more Mephi in my life, that's for sure. And I will talk to you once I'm halfway through the next book. So I'm halfway through the Bone Shard Emperor and so I thought I'd give you a quick update. I must confess I'm struggling a little bit more with the second book. I feel like we've lost a little bit of momentum of the story and I think the reason is that we get fewer Jovis chapters and more of the other perspectives. And I don't know how I feel about that. I'm a huge fan of Jovis, so his perspective has definitely been my favorite in the first book. And just his humor and his character has really pulled me through the story. And so now I'm definitely lacking some of that. I feel like we also see a bit of a shift in his character, which makes it a bit more unappealing to me, to be honest. So far, I'm not like completely hooked on the story, even though I do like the development of Lynn's character a little bit more now. I still feel like because she's very closed off and very lonely, um, it is hard to reach her also as a reader, not only for the other characters. And then we do get a new villain figure that um, is quite surprising to me. I didn't really expect this person to become a villain but um, I do think it is an interesting idea but I'm not quite sure how I feel about the execution. I feel like there are some like plot holes or just like decisions that don't really make any sense. I'm not obsessed with it and I don't really like the chapters that we get from that perspective so we'll see how often that happens throughout the book. But we're definitely much more focused on Lynn now and on her like journey. She's definitely 
getting out there more and we're following that. We also learn more about the Alanga, which I think is interesting, but it's like slow going. So we have a couple of developments like uh, Jovis finds a book that is written by the Alanga and starts translating it. And I just, I don't really like how that is incorporated in the beginning of his chapters now. I don't know, it just feels a bit odd to me. Um, and then we also have a character who just popped up, who um, openly says that they are an Alanga. And they're kind of trying to help now, I guess. But it's not really sure whether we can really trust this character. But it is implied that through this character we might finally learn some more like hard facts about them because in this world that we've been following so far all of the knowledge about the Alanga has basically been forgotten and there's just like these folk tales which don't really have anything to do with the real history so getting more facts about what is actually going on like what are they is quite intriguing I hope that things will pick up a little bit but um, so far, I'm still within the like four star range of enjoyment. But I would like to just see a little bit more now. I feel like we have like the like political machinations, but they don't reach a level that I enjoy. Like I do like good politics in a book, but just because of the way that Lin is, it just never reaches the level of intricacy that would make me enjoy it. But I am enjoying it and I'm intrigued to see where the series goes, so I'll let you know when I finish the book. So... I'm having a migraine day and I thought the best thing to do to survive is finish my audiobook, The Bone Shard Emperor, and now I'm here to talk about it. This is the second book in the series and I, I'm i not quite sure how I feel about it for, like, I don't know. Um, I think it's a four-star read as well. But I'm like unsure how the reading experience compares to the first book because I don't know, like I feel like I cared for the characters more in the second book because in the first one I was just very focused on Jovis and Mephi and now I feel like I also really care for Lin and also for Falu and Ranami and even for, what's his name, Gio? <laughs> But then there's also other things I did not like so much about the second book. I feel like it meandered a little bit more. It took a very long time to get to new conclusions, to new knowledge about what's going on in this world. Yeah, I don't know. Like, we have this romance now, which I don't know how I feel about it. I still don't know. Like, it's kind of cute. But at the same time, I don't I don't really need romance in my stories, so I could have lived without it, to be honest. I think I still enjoyed it. I'm a little bit confused because I expected something very, very different from the ending. Because I've heard that there is a time jump between the second and the third book. I think it's a two-year time jump. And that people wanted a resolution to something that they didn't get, so I thought there would be something like very explosive and crazy happening at the end where you need to know how it ended or something like that, like like kind of a cliffhanger or something like that. But there wasn't. And now I'm completely confused. Like it was a good ending. Um, I think the way it wrapped up, you know there's more to come, but it is satisfying. And so now I'm completely confused. And I guess because I had that expectation, now I'm just like... Did I miss something? <laughs> I don't know. Like, obviously, we have, like, a lot of, like, reveals during this end. And one definitely gave me goosebumps as well. But, yeah, I don't know. I just, I, f I felt like it was a solid ending. And I can totally see how this story continues with a time jump now, if it's done well. So, we'll see. I take a little bit of a break before going into the third book. But um, not too long. So... Um, it will all still be very fresh in my mind. So I'm very, very 
excited to continue this. I think it's a solid series. I think I did expect more from it, but that's fine. I must say the one thing I really did not enjoy until the end is that we get the point of view of the villain in the story. If you could say that there is a singular villain because there's a lot going on, but like there's one character that turns out to be quite the villain, even though there's there's more going on. Um, but yeah, their perspective, I did not like. I did not like at all. And I would always roll my eyes when we got another chapter from their perspective. That was just not for me. I do understand roughly the idea behind it because we had the perspective in the first book and that definitely added something also some intrigue but I felt like in this book it did not it did not and add anything for me um, I did not understand the character better I did not feel for the character more maybe a little bit at the end but then they crushed it very quickly so yeah I I would have liked that to not be in the book at all to be honest um, so yeah, four stars, solid read. Um, I would recommend the series still if you're interested, but we'll see. Maybe I change my mind after the last book. So I do want to go into a couple of short spoilers. Um, so if you haven't read the second book, please jump over it using the chapters and then we can talk about the final book together. I think the most shocking revelation of the whole book is, for me personally, is that Gio is Dion. <laughs> I did not see that coming and the moment when Lin realizes with the translation of the like diary, I had such goosebumps. I was like, oh my god, now it all makes sense, like his whole character and what he said to Jovis, I believe, um, that um, the Sukais killed everyone he knew suddenly completely makes sense. I guess there's still like a ton of questions about the Alanga and how it all works. Like he is like how old? Like a thousand years or something? I don't know. Um, so that's kind of interesting because it seems like what makes you an Alanga is bonding with an Ocelin, but then you need that one bone that people got taken out during the tithing festivals to be able to bond with one. And that is quite a lot because it means that basically everyone could be an Alanga, but they're not because the Ocelin kind of choose, but we also have no idea where the Ocelin even come from. So at the end we also see that Ayash found an Ocelin when her uh, original island sank. So that was something I kind of suspected, like with the food and everything, you kind of have that suspicion. So I guess that we will see many more Alanga popping up um, at in, in the third book. And there's also this scene where they are traveling to Nefalanu and they know that there will be at least one other Alanga on the island and there's actually at least two because we now know it's Gio and also Ayash. So uh, is Ayash already there when she visits? I don't remember but she must be right. Uh, I, it's my grain day. Sometimes I don't get these things straight. But yeah I'm intrigued to see how especially if we have a time jump now how um, that will develop because is there a lot of Ocelin? We don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just intrigued. I like the whole idea about it and I also like the idea that Gio has been like slowly working on um, bringing his people back but then it's not really a people, I guess, because like everyone could be one. It's a, it's a bit confusing to be honest but yeah, we'll see. I'm very intrigued to hear more about that in the final book. I was a little bit mad about Tithus dying in the last battle. I um, It's like one of those things where you have characters where you just know they will die and then they do and I just... Uh, I didn't like it. Mephi is taken, which that might be the thing people were talking about. I don't know. I'm just trying to imagine what could be the thing that people wanted to know so badly. 
and that isn't really dealt with in the beginning of the book, I don't know, but um, maybe it's that. It definitely makes me a bit nervous about the last book just because Mephi is the thing that is like pulling me through the story. Like I love him so much. He is just the best and his connection with Jovis especially is just amazing and I love it. And then we have the whole monk situation. Like I do not like the guy, obviously, um, and because we see him through Jovis's eyes, um, it's very hard to like him, I guess. Um, he seems very annoying at first, but then we realize that it's much more than that. So the last glimpse we get is that now Nisong is going to look for him and they might do some kind of an alliance, which sounds terrible, especially since the last book is called The Bone Shot War. So um, that can't be good. But again, that would make sense that we need a little bit of a time jump for the last book so that they can probably gather strength before um, the story really continues. A lot was going on with that. I'm intrigued to read the last book. As I said, just taking a small little break, um, listening to something else in between and then we'll get into the Bone Shard War and see how it all ends. Hello, it is time for my halfway update for the Bone Shard War is where I'm at. Um, I'm halfway through this book and this is the longest book in the series and I can already tell you that it does not need to be. This is a bit meandering and um, we have a time jump. I think we have a time jump of around two years between the second and the third book but I was prepared for that. I was told that and I'm fine with it. I don't have any issues to be honest. I think one thing that makes this a little bit difficult is that we have characters that get separated in this book and the book is kind of suffering for it. It would have been better if we keep seeing these characters together and I think that also makes it drag a little bit. But the thing that I dislike the most about this book so far is the chapters that we get from one of the villains point of views and I hate it. It gives me the biggest ick ever. I don't like it. I did not like those chapters in the second book. I hate them even more in this book and I don't think that they're necessary. I don't think that they really add anything to the story apart from the ick. Like, all we need to know about the villain characters, we do learn through our other characters as well. So there's really no point to it, apart from it being annoying and gross, and I do not like it. Apart from that, we do get more chapters from the other characters that we are used to. Um, my favorite POV um, is lacking a little bit, so I need more of that. <laughs> To be honest. I would say that the story is quite meandering. We don't really know what anyone's really doing. They don't know what they're doing. They're in way over their heads and so yeah it just feels all a bit pointless. They are chasing things across the aisles. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it yet. I think this will be yet another like four star book. I think that this series overall is more on the disappointing end for me, but just because I wanted to love it, I wanted it to be great. And it's just not. It is solid. It's a good fantasy series, but if you hear the praise from everyone, <laughs> then sometimes the expectations get a little bit too much. I would say if you like this series, Definitely try the duology by Adeline Grace, um, All the Stars and Teeth is the first book. Very similar vibes, a lot more gruesome in my opinion, a lot more fun in my opinion, and 
I just really like that book a lot better <laughs> and I just keep thinking about it. But yeah, I'm, I'm not disliking The Bone Shot War, but I also think it could be better. It's still a long way to go, it's still over nine hours, so I'm intrigued to see where it ends up, but right now at the halfway point I don't have the feeling that it builds up for a grand finale. I have a feeling of our main characters just kind of stumbling through the finale. And that's a bit disappointing. That's that's my feelings right now. I still love the things that I loved. And I still dislike the things that I disliked. And so we're just moving forward. And I'll talk to you once I finish this final book. I have done it. I have finished The Bone Shot War. I'm done with the series, which is exciting. Like, I always like finishing series. It's such a satisfying feeling to be done with such a big story. But unfortunately, this book wasn't that satisfying to me personally. I gave it four stars. I think it is, you know, on par with the other books in the series. It's a good fantasy book, but nothing really exceptional for me personally. I really wanted to love this series, but just with the way the characters were and how meandering the storylines were, it just wasn't my favorite, unfortunately. I don't really see why a lot of people didn't like this last book. Uh, I felt like it continued the story quite well. Lots of the comments I've heard on the last book don't really make sense to me and I think it is much different if you don't read the series all in one go, but if you have waited like a year for the last book maybe, then it might feel very different. But to me it was just like a good tone all over the books. <laughs> like there was no book where I was like, oh my god, what happened here? <laughs> So yeah, I think that this is a solid series, but I think it is a little bit overhyped. <laughs> I think that especially all the people who loved the first book so much, I don't quite understand. Like, it, as I said, it was fine, it was good. It's a conclusion. It does um, tie up all of the like loose strands in the end, which is nice. And it felt like the characters definitely had to pay a price for what happened at the end, so it wasn't too easy, but still I feel like we as the readers also get kind of what we want in the end and that's always a little bit nice too, you know. So yeah, I would recommend the series if you are interested. As I said, it's very a solid series. It's, uh, you know, an island fantasy with lots of ships and traveling and smuggling and armies and magic. So uh, I think you can't really go wrong with that. Just yeah, I think it just is important whether you like these characters or not, especially for a reader like me, because I'm 100% character-driven reader, so that's the most important thing for me. And for the main characters that we get with Lynn, I was fine with her, but I didn't really like her, I didn't really care. I love Jovis, but especially in the third book, <laughs> his storyline was not the kindest. Um, I loved Mephi. Mephi is great. Um, I had such a hard time with Ni Song. I just... Oh, her chapters... Her chapters were like torture to me. <laughs> um, I liked the Sand chapters. I liked Ronami's chapters. I liked Falu a lot, but I felt like we, we never got really enough of her perspective. So yeah, it was quite a mixed bag and... That's, I think, all I can say without spoiling anything. So I think for the last couple of minutes I will go into a couple of spoilers. So if you have not read this last book, thank you so much for watching. I hope you had fun watching this vlog. Let me know whether you have decided to pick this series up now or to continue on if you've already started it. And I will talk to you very soon. Bye!
and then for all the other people let's get into a couple of spoilers now I think what I don't quite understand is that I heard a lot of people complain about something that happens within the time jump um, and I think what they were talking about is Jovis and I didn't really understand the critique that that got because I felt like it was resolved like very quickly. I mean, you have like, I think chapter two where it's mentioned that he's dead. And then in chapter three, you already learn what really happened. So it wasn't like for half the book, you think that Jovis is dead or something. So I didn't really understand why people were upset about that. I think that the time junk actually worked. Um, it helped prepare the characters for what was to come in the big final fight without having us to go through all the training sequences, which I'm not mad about. I, do, I yeah, I thought that worked really well. Um, I think that the whole struggle with Jovis and the commands was dragged out a little bit. Like when, what is the island? Uh, Isla? Was it Isla? When Isla sank and um, Jovis got away, and then was recaptured on the boat. I was like, okay, if that's how it's gonna go now, if we're gonna continue with the whole mess with Kefra, I'm out of here. Like, I hate that. But then, and then fortunately, he um, got Feline on his side and it didn't turn out that way. But like, I was so done with that storyline because yeah, I just don't like it when things feel like very hopeless. I also felt like the way he got around the commands didn't make any sense um, in some uh, aspects. There was one command where, I don't know, he did like this really uh, difficult mental flip to get out of the command and I felt like there was a much easier way to do it. Whenever like a character is outsmarting someone or something and I feel like he's not doing a very smart job about it. That bothers me so much because that's the moment where I'm like, yeah, okay, the author is also just a person. <laughs> They're not the smartest person in the world. They also sometimes don't know how to write the super smart characters. I don't know, just, yeah, that just wasn't my favorite part. And then at the end, when we uh, see him basically die um, and then he's brought into the pool and everything, I just, uh, I don't know how I felt about that. Like him not being bonded to Mephi anymore is like the saddest thing in the world. And even though at the end they do rebond, I just felt like kind of we're paying with the one thing that I adored about the series. Like I don't care about the like whole romancey schmancy stuff. But the bond of Mephi and Jovis was, was what kept me going through this whole series. And to lose that at the end, I don't know how I felt about that. I did not really, really like that. I must admit that at the end, I was happy that Sand and Loji bonded. It was really cute. But, oh, Nisong was just so horrible. I hate her so much. I hate her so much. Like, how can people be so set in their thoughts, like they can't get out of their own head, they can't see what they're doing. Like this woman basically killed all of her friends for nothing. And then it's still like, mm, eh, it was all the other people who stopped me from starting a war. Like you started the war, why? I don't know, I just, ugh, I could not with her. Like her chapters were the worst for me. Apart from that, as I said, I like Falu, I like Ronami. I think it's really cool that Ronami in the end was the one who got to implement all the political change. And I also liked like the ending where they're like, well, this is not an efficient government anymore. So yay, <laughs> because we can definitely see that in our governments nowadays a little bit too. But, um, yeah, so I liked that little side remark. Um, but yeah, overall, I had fun with this. I'm glad I had Chovis and Mephi to kind of drag me along <laughs> through this story. And yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts. And I think, I think I'm gonna stop recording now. So see you soon with the next series uh, marathon. <laughs>